You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week, I'd like to talk about how you can take part in the most advanced democracy on the planet. And it's probably not the one that you think it is. So I want to talk about how we as individuals can all take part in democratic change. Now, as you may know, I'm not a fan of politics, so this isn't going to be about the kind of democracy that you might be thinking of. But I am going to talk about how you can vote to make a peaceful change in the world um, in an incredibly effective way. What I want to talk about is consumer democracy, the democracy of economics, rather than the democracy of politics. And I will explain what I mean by that. But before I go into that, I want to just give a brief outline of what the appeal of political democracy is to people. Because although I'm not a fan of politics, I know there are some things that appeal to people about democracy as a political process. And in many ways, I think those things are actually more effectively fulfilled by consumer democracy of the marketplace. So what are those things? I think when people think about voting and democracy, there are a couple of things that appeal to them. I mean, there isn't that much good that can be said about democracy. Most people know that quote by Winston Churchill, that democracy is the worst of all possible systems except for all the others. And I think that's probably the way that a lot of people think about it. But there are a couple of things that people do think about as being the kind of virtues of democracy. And these are the things that really appeal to people about democracy. And the first of those things is the idea of kind of nonviolent change. Karl Popper wrote quite a lot about this. Um, he, he sort of praised democracy as being a way of having a nonviolent change of leadership within society. And people like that idea, I think, that, you know, we're into nonviolence, we want to change things. Voting seems to be better than getting out weapons and trying to have some kind of armed revolution or something like that. So definitely the, the appeal of democracy is an idea of some kind of nonviolent change. And the other thing that I think appeals to people when they do think about the benefits of democracy is the idea that somehow it's a good thing for everyone to have their say. No man is an island. We all sort of live together and we, we live in society and we're all interdependent on each other. And so in some sense, I think people like the idea that everyone should have their say. And what I'm going to talk about today is really taking those ideas to their logical extreme and thinking how can we have the most effective way of everyone having their say and of creating nonviolent change uh, in the world. And the argument that I'm going to make is that it's economics, not politics, that really achieves this in the most fundamental way. It's the marketplace of free exchange that provides the most effective kind of democracy and the most effective kind of voting that is possible. And in order to explain this, I'd, I'd like to read a quote from Ludwig von Mises. This comes from an article called The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And what Mises says is this. Capitalists lose their funds as soon as they fail to invest them in those lines in which they satisfy the best demands of the public. In a daily repeated plebiscite in which every penny gives a right to vote, the consumers determine who should own and run the plants, shops and farms. The control of the material means of production is a social function subject to confirmation or revocation by the sovereign consumers. 
So what Mises is talking about in this quote is that every day when you go and spend money in the marketplace, what you are effectively doing is voting with your wallet. You're voting on how resources in society should be allocated um, in a very direct way. And you're doing it with every penny that you spend on goods and services. You're choosing what society invests in and which direction society goes in. And Mises makes the point that this is the way people vote on who should have control over the productive resources of society. Because those people who are making things that people want get votes of support in terms of money. And those people who make, who make things that people don't want uh, lose support in terms of money. So I'm going to explain in a bit more detail how this process of voting with your wallet actually works. Every time you go out and spend money on something, you have a whole series of effects on the world that you're not aware of at all. But you send out signals and those signals get picked up by a whole group of people who you'll probably never meet, but who nonetheless experience an impact of your choice in, in buying something or indeed of selling something, if that's what you're doing too. So the signals you send out when you buy something is that you raise the price of that thing. You increase demand and you raise the price. If you buy a house in a specific area, you are raising the price of housing in that area. If you buy a coffee in a coffee shop, you are pushing the price of coffee in that area upwards. So that's the first thing that you do. Without knowing it, you change prices just by buying something. And it works the other way too. If you open a coffee shop, you are lowering the price of coffee in that area. And if you build a new residential block, you are lowering the price of housing in that area. If you create a new smartphone, you are lowering the price of smartphones. So this is the first kind of effect that your voting with your wallet or your purse has on the world around you. You send these price signals out and the price signals themselves have an impact, a very, very direct impact and also a much further indirect impact. The first obvious direct impact is that you are supporting individual companies by buying things from them and you are removing your support from other companies if you stop buying things from them. So if you buy Apple products, you are supporting Apple. And if you stop buying Microsoft products, you're removing your support from Microsoft. And this has a huge impact. This is what the kind of shifts that we see where the you know once incredibly dominating, powerful Microsoft now looks increasingly ridiculous and irrelevant. And Apple is now where Microsoft was, only even bigger. So that's the impact that you have. You send price signals, and in sending price signals, you also support individual companies. But it goes further than that. It's not just that you support an individual company like Apple. If you buy Apple products, what you do is you also encourage competition. So, for example, if you buy an iPhone, you encourage smartphone competition. You encourage Samsung and all of the other people developing Android phones and so forth to develop competing smartphones. Because what happens when you support a specific business is that you help them sell at higher prices by giving, putting pressure on their price upwards by creating demand. And that sends a signal out to all the entrepreneurs around them who see what they're doing and they see, wow, look at Apple selling the iPhone for that price. I bet we could do that and make a good profit, but still sell it cheaper. And so what happens is that those competitors then rush into that marketplace and start providing alternatives. So your choice to buy one product 
sends out price signals. It supports the individual company that you're buying from. And it also sends out a message to all these other entrepreneurs to pull resources in towards that area that you bought the product in. And the final effect of all of that is that you actually end up lowering the price of the thing that you bought because suddenly, you know, there's this incredible new concentration of activity in this one area and there's all this competition, there's innovation and consequently, eventually, the price itself is lowered. So just by buying that smartphone, you encourage the initial person who produced it you encourage all of the competitors who rush in and produce uh, competing versions of it. And ultimately, you make smartphones cheaper for everyone. Because now, all of these clever minds have worked on how to make better smartphones cheaper, more efficiently, more effectively, and so forth. And consequently, we now have cheaper smartphones. And you can see this process, in, especially in the IT industry, because it's a relatively free market. Uh, you can see it working better than in other industries that are more regulated. So this is an example of emergence. And it's a really beautiful process, a really amazing thing, because it connects all of these people who don't know each other personally together in a social system, which leads to innovation and new products and cheaper products being created all through this democracy of voting with dollars or pounds or whatever, voting with your wallet, voting with your purse. Emergence in this way is the kind of process that no individual person is in control of, but everyone has a say in. And that's what the marketplace does. And that's why I call it the most advanced democracy on the planet. Because that kind of voting where you get to choose very, very specifically between individual companies and individual products, and you get to vote any time you want. You can go out and buy something and vote, or you can stop buying something and remove your vote. That is a really, really advanced kind of democracy. And it's the kind of democracy that makes political democracy just look ridiculous in comparison. So when you think about those things that you imagine being good about political democracy, the marketplace is light years ahead. When you think about everyone having a say and creating change in a nonviolent way through cooperation, when you think about everyone being sort of together in a shared, interconnected, interdependent world, markets are the most advanced expression of that kind of idea uh, behind you know what people think think is good about democracy and political democracy just looks ridiculous in comparison you know, it's so obviously inefficient corrupt fraudulent and abusive of power in comparison and the amazing thing is even though everyone knows that political democracy is so ridiculously inefficient corrupt and abusive of power, people still think that they know better than the amazing emergent dynamics of marketplaces. People imagine that they know better than how a, an emergent market that is outside of any individual's control, they imagine that they know better and that they can put in rules to make that market come to some kind of, quote, better outcome than it otherwise would do if people were left alone to get on with working together cooperatively in a non-violent, non-coercive, voluntary way. So when people talk to you about democracy and the things that are supposedly good about democracy, think about the beautiful emergence of a voluntary market interaction where every individual is sending signals to people all around the world that they probably will never meet um, through their shared experience of working together in a marketplace. And that, I think, is a far more awe-inspiring and wonderful achievement than the 
laughably incompetent, corrupt, and abusive political kind of democracy that people actually think about when they think of democracy. So I hope that is uh, food for thought, especially in this time of year when people in the States are going to be uh, seeing a lot in the news about democracy and voting. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.